medical center to move it up from non-medical to endovascular. So we heard earlier from Dr. Neville what you can do with a knife, and here we'll discuss what you can do with a scalpel for the treatment of uh, diabetic patients. Thank you for having me. I have no disclosures. So there's a big explosion of uh, endovascular interventions for peripheral arterial disease, which we will know a clearer way of, of, uh, of MSXC or what to help guide us. Uh, Dr. Neville showed the slide before, there's been a huge surge in endovascular interventions with an overall decrease in time over lower extremity amputations. However, this is about a three to one uh, proportion, it really isn't proportional at all. Um, really only data that's randomized data comparing open versus endovascular interventions for PAD was the basal trial, which does have its limitations and which showed that people uh, who are in more than two years benefit from bypass. However, this hasn't stopped the endovascular evolution. And it further showed in some uh, sequent analysis that those who initially failed endovascular interventions did worse when they had their bypass and initially had a bypass the first time. And a huge search, especially in the United States, based on a reimbursement of atherectomy. However, there's really quite a paucity of any evidence supporting atherectomy. Uh, it's a Cochrane analysis which shows no difference in outcomes. And, and also, two trials showing increased distal embolizations as well. So you may be making people worse without even helping them. But this hasn't stopped the guidance. Uh, there are two other trials going on right now, the Basel II trial and the best CLI, CLI trial, which I know many places in Canada are part of, and these could add more data to help us out. So what does exist, though? This is an uh, analysis from Beth Isherkeepness in Boston that shows that diabetes, regardless of the intervention that you had, open or endovascular interventions, is a risk factor independently for long-term amputation of, of these patients. So this is why it's particularly important is this going to work? <laughs> so diabetics compared to non-diabetics. How do they do with endovascular interventions? Really is the crux of this talk here. Uh, we're looking at a single series of a, over 2,000 endovascular interventions. Patients with diabetics overall had higher comorbidities, more heavily calcified lesions, poor runoff vessels, and also multi-vessel disease. So they're presenting at a more advanced phase, and overall they're sicker. And these patients had, did have a higher amputation rate over time, a hazard ratio of five, and also a higher mortality at 12 months as well. However, when analyzing two uh, randomized control type trials retrospectively of all patients with critical lipid ischemia, of which almost half were diabetics, when looking at the univariable data, the diabetics definitely had a higher risk of amputation, 34% to 20%. However, when done a multivariable analysis, this factored out that was no longer significant as an independent uh, association for amputation with Rutherford category, your degree of ischemia, and your, your presentation ABI as clinically significant. And no difference in mortality as well. So the diabetes itself may not be the factor for these patients which may be sicker because they have more advanced disease. And also another analysis looking at um, angioplasty for critical ischemia patients showed no difference in 36 months a new variable analysis for amputation, restenosis, improvement in ABI, improvement in ABI was of three months and 36 months in diabetics versus non-diabetics. So the data is a little bit all over the map on these people, um, but overall there's no clear consensus that diabetes in itself is causing these people to have higher mortality or amputations. Uh, specifically looking at clotting cancer with atherectomy, this is a, an analysis, this is a prospectively collected uh, trial looking at atherectomy Overall, about 600 patients uh, plus patients, 598 were clonicans. This showed no difference in uh, primary patency, walking distance, or ABI or Rutherford class at one year. So even with atherectomy, diabetics uh, and non-diabetics uh, fare the same. What if you break it down between insulin-dependent and non-insulin-dependent uh, diabetics? This is a single center study from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston that compared overall the non as independent diabetics behave in a lot of ways like the, like the uh, non-diabetics. The insulin dependent diabetics were younger, they presented with tissue loss more commonly, more likely to have coronary disease and stage renal disease, and they had worse complete wound healing and follow-up, they had higher three-year major amputation, and, had a, and um, overall uh, risk of uh, reinterventions as well. Uh, what about angiosomes? Angiosomes is a hot topic nowadays. Th 
this implies that if you have a heel ulcer, then therefore you have to get the blood vessels to the heel open rather than to the front of the foot. Where in the old days of the bypass, usually the pressure is good enough that you got blood flow to the front of the foot, it would feed the back of the foot. Um, and the vascular allows you to open more than one vessel, and is this important or not? Um, looking at direct versus indirect um, angiogram vascularizations in a single center, the indirect numbers were 36%. Overall, complete, complete wound healing was higher at 12 months with direct revascularization and freedom from male. The amputation free survival, however, were not different um, with direct revascularization at 24 months. Um, we're looking at wound healing, though, a multivariable analysis, indirect vascularization was a higher risk of not healing your wound, though. So this implies that there is a role for this in, in wound healing. And we have plenty of patients out there that may not get an amputation, but are still suffering with wounds. So just because you don't get an amputation doesn't mean you're not you're doing okay. Uh, the meta-analysis, looking at wound healing and amputation-free survival, showing a benefit of wound healing and amputation-free survival with direct angiosome revascularization. What about the pedal arch? How important is that? We did people discuss that earlier today. This is it's popular on Twitter, but not too much in the research. This is an article on Twitter. Someone's saying, my first pedal arch intervention. I'm sure the patient appreciated that if they saw it. Uh, not perfect, but just trying to help this patient. And you can see they have a nice picture here and a nice job. Now, unfortunately, with all these Twitter posts, you never see the follow up, you never see the wounds. And most likely, the person doing the intervention doesn't either. Uh, this is another example of someone with a foot wound and a pedal arch revascularization. However, however, they do not have a complete arch and it really goes nowhere. So does that person really benefit from anything? Probably not. Get an angiogram in two, three months, there's a good chance there'd be nothing there. Um, when looking at people with complete versus incomplete versus absent pedal arches, this is a retrospective analysis of over 130 interventions. This is what they find as a, as a complete arch, which still does have some disease in it. Uh, incomplete and no arch. These are their examples. And healing at three months was overall better in those with uh, complete arches and incomplete and absent arches, as was uh, limb salvage and survival. But this also tells you the fact that survival is different, that these are most likely patients that are very different from each other too. And it's maybe a marker of just more advanced disease and there's no risk just analysis performed as well. So it's really just kind of general differences and associations. Uh, what about pedal arch versus angiosome? This is the same group that showed that direct angiosome did not affect either three month healing or one year limb salvage. However, the pedal arch had a positive impact on univertebral analysis of both three month healing and one year limb salvage. Going even further, what if we incorporate the degree of infection in the foot and ischemia in the foot, along with angiosomes, along with pedal arch. This is a great paper that came out of Johns Hopkins, looking at the Wi-Fi scoring system to show you a degree of uh, both wound uh, infection and ischemia in the foot. And they have 99 patients. They retrospectively analyzed. 47% were Wi-Fi 4. That's the most severe form of foot presentation. And they showed that Wi-Fi stage on univariate analysis and Kaplan-Meier analysis had um, better effects on time to wound healing where angiosome perfusion and pedal arch did not. And a multivariable analysis, right, the first paper I've been able to show that actually has some of the multivariable analysis, uh, that Wi-Fi stage of three and four was independently associated with not healing where pedal arch did not make a difference and angiosome did not make a difference. So this is the first paper to incorporate all three of these things in there. And what other, besides wound healing and, and other complications, what other things diabetics face? Contrast-induced nephropathy is a complication of endovascular interventions. And one analysis showed that there's no difference between diabetics and non-diabetics in that either. So just one case I want to end this with. This is a 44-year-old male. Diabetic, smoker, he's probably one of the sickest 44 year olds you're going to see. He has uh, CKD stage 3, he has CAD, he's had a PCI before, uh, he's had a cabbage uh, before as well, and neuropathy, and he's had a, a previous MI. I randomized him in the best CLI trial for open versus endo. He, this is his foot, this is how he presented. 
this was a study. So you see he has both uh, SFA disease, proximally and little distally, severe tibial disease um, going down with mostly an disease anterior tibial artery coming back. You see it further down the leg here. The anterior tibial artery is on the screen right. And down the foot. He got randomized to endovascular and I was able to reopen both his SFA pop and both his uh, distal flows into the tibial artery uh, down lower. Really had nothing resembling a pedal arch down there, so he maybe be an incomplete one based on what you see here. And overall, I was happy with the result, thought he would do well. And he was a sick guy, so I was probably breathing a sigh of relief that he got endovascular and not open um, intervention on the randomization. However, despite being an endovascular candidate, he postgraduately had an STEMI clash fulmer edema, acute renal failure to uh, creatinine of greater than four. He had a prolonged intubation for two and a half weeks, and in all that time, it's all delayed him having his amputation. Cardiology was concerned about doing a PCI on him because of his creatinine going up, so that got delayed too. And three weeks later, he did have a TMA, as you see here. At rehab, though, the next day, he had bilious emesis, was admitted to another hospital. So, intervention was done in January. This is February, just for timeline. Uh, developed pneumonia, ARDS, left side stroke, ended up getting pegged. Um, he had a recurrent um, ATN, and he disappeared, even though he's in a randomized NIH trial for uh, three months, and then finally presented back uh, with this. Right down here, and you see his some bone exposed. And he had enough at that point and uh, ended up with a BK the other day. So even though we're endovascular treating these people, uh, they're still very sick people, and endovascular is not a free trip either. So overall conclusion, poor evidence has driven the practice in the explosion of endovascular interventions in these diabetics. Um, randomized trials up coming up, including basal two and the best CLI trial, hopefully report, provide more data and guidance. Um, Diabetics to have more advanced presentation, more severe disease. It's this advanced presentation, severe disease, that's most likely, most likely the risk of a high longer term morbidity, mortality, not necessarily the diabetes itself. And further investigations to any of the concepts are needed. Thank you.